All right, folks, welcome back to the Believe in Rams podcast. I'm your host, Jake Ellenbogen. This is episode 129. And joining me, first guest on this podcast that I you know, just started doing, is uh, my buddy from uh, a while ago when I first started content creating. I uh, reached out to this guy, absolute stud out of uh, Syracuse, and um, you know, ended up making the Rams roster. He played under Sean McVay. Please welcome my special guest, Cameron Lynch, All right. the Rams linebacker. Appreciate you for having me, Jake. Yeah, man, it's it's good to to finally connect. You know, I know we were supposed to connect way back then when I was in St. Louis uh, with the Rams. I know we're in L.A. now, but uh, it's it's nice to finally connect, my man. Absolutely, Cam. It's it's awesome to have you on. Um, you know, I I have a tremendous amount of respect for what you've done in the league, but in addition to that, just what you've been doing as an analyst as well. I mean, throughout your career, um, I did see a cover in the Super Bowl when uh, Tampa Bay was uh, you know hosting that Super Bowl. So you've done a really nice job, and um, proud of you, man. Uh, but you know, kind of absolutely. But you know, kind of diving into it, uh, the first topic that I wanted to discuss. And, you know, I think before I even say that guys, if you like this show at all, be sure to subscribe, like comment on all platforms. Um, Really appreciate that. But uh, first topic, let's just recap the season, man, because I think it's really important, you know, going through those six games, it was a roller coaster. I mean, you talk about, you know, the ring ceremony, the night of uh, week one against Buffalo and you get all excited and all that. And they kind of just take the wind out of your sails. I mean, even still, the Rams were in that game in the fourth quarter, 17 to 10, but ends up being a blowout. Um, Then you go and you beat the Falcons and you start off the the first half, you know, dominating them. You let them back into it. So it's been that kind of year where they haven't really had a dominant performance. Even the Panthers game that we just saw, they felt like they could have, you know, won that by a lot more. And the Panthers hung around in a game where they didn't even score an offensive touchdown. So, I mean, you know, take me through, you know, your thoughts so far on the season, uh, I guess, starting with quarterback play. Yeah. So I think you mentioned it uh, just just now. The Panthers, the only time that they scored was on a Rams turnover. Right. And so I went back right before we hopped on this podcast here, Jake. I went back and I looked at the games and saw the, the turnover ratio you know, for the Rams, for the Falcons, for the Cardinals uh, and and the Bills. And the Rams have turned the ball over a lot. The name of the game right now, I think, for the Rams, we're heading into this bye, is protect the football. At the end of the day, you got to protect the football. As a defensive player, my coaches always used to tell us, guys, if we can win the turnover margin, the likelihood of us winning a game is, is... is astronomical. Like if you score a touchdown on defense, like the the percentage goes up about 30 to 40 percent. It's kind of insane. And so protecting the football has been the name of the game. And I think Matthew Stafford making better decisions, I think, is really important. So I would like to see him do that coming out of the bye. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've been a big defender of Matthew Stafford. I think last year, everyone looks at the interceptions, the 17 interceptions. They don't really talk much about the 41 touchdowns or the fact that, you know, Josh Allen had two fewer, you know, Joe Burrow had three fewer, Justin Herbert, you know. And so while I have defended him in that right, I do think this year it's been a little hard to defend some of the decisions he's made. Now, he's played incredible football with that offensive line. Uh, that has generated more pressures on him or given up more pressures on him than he has ever gone up against in the first six games. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, But at the same time, you're absolutely right, Cam. You know, you can't be throwing that ball uh, into a tight window like that to Cooper Cup when you have the ball, you have the lead, and now you're just trying to run out the clock, maybe kick a field goal, maybe you get an explosive play. But the last thing you're trying to do is let Carolina take the lead going into half when they've been absolutely dominated to that point. Uh, So I totally agree with you there. We saw in the Falcons game, the throw to Tyler Higby in the end zone, he was blanketed. Um, Obviously, we don't always know whose fault it really is. I mean, Orlovsky on ESPN said, you know, he blamed Cooper Cup on that. And maybe that's the case, but you just don't want to put yourself in those positions, especially when you have the talent you have. But also, now that you have the offensive line that you have, it's not perfect. You can't put yourself in those positions where now, you know, on third down, 
you know, late in the game, this defense just gets to pin their ears back and rush the passer with no help, you know? So yeah, I tough. agree with you there. It becomes very tough as a quarterback. Uh, but looking at the running back room, All it becomes right. even tougher as <laughs> yeah. a quarterback when you don't have a run game. So Cam, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. I have a lot of my own that I've already said uh, on this channel and, and on this podcast, but I'm very interested to hear what you think about this running back room. Yeah, there, there's a lot going on here. Uh, one thing that, that made me really excited to see Malcolm Brown in the Rams lineup. I know he's wearing number 41. I When I came to the Rams, I played with Malcolm. We were in the same class to, to see a veteran in the room um, at a time like this, I think is really important. Um, there's been a lot of change. Uh, you got the acre situation. Like there's a lot going on. And so the, the, the positive thing is to seeing a veteran in the room that's been there before, I think is extremely important. So whatever happens after that, they have that foundation there. Um, and like you said, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough to be successful at the quarterback position when you can't really rely on the offensive line to block for you or the running game is not doing too well. So you just got to sling the ball, right? You got to sling the ball and pray <laughs> something, something well happens uh, down the field. And so that that can be that can be an issue and so i know the rams right now they're <laughs> they're scra they're searching the internet they're they're talking to their contacts to figure out how to uh how to how to fix that situation but um until then i think matthew stafford he's going to be in trouble when it comes to turning the ball over yeah cam you know i think it's a it's a multi-layered thing because obviously you have cam Akers, the other cam uh <laughs> you know you have cam Akers who I mean, the Rams drafted, he's the highest pick they've had in five years. And he just, he's shown you some things. Obviously, at the end of 2020, he looked like a potential star. Uh, but unfortunately, you have a torn Achilles, um, which really does not have a good track record for players coming back from that. You look at Marlon Mack as a recent example. A poor guy, you know, was looking at a thousand yards with the Colts. And now he's not on an NFL team. He just got cut by the 49ers. So it's a really tough, I don't have to tell you, it's a really tough business, even if you're healthy. So now, you know, when you're, you're going through that injury, um, you know, and I think you try to force yourself to come back. And I don't think, you know, Cam, I have to make this very clear. I don't think Cam forcing himself to come back, you know, be a part of that Super Bowl run. I don't think that had anything to do with him, you know, now. I think he just... He's not quite seeing the holes. He, he wasn't, you know, hitting the right holes. And and I think the the vision's always been kind of a concern for me, kind of coming out of FSU. Uh, remember, he didn't play in the golden age of FSU. He did not play with Jameis Winston. You know, Jimbo Fisher at his best. He played at the end of that, uh, the dark age, if you will, with not a lot of help in the offensive line. So I think he was used to just running back, uh, you know, contact behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, whereas, you know, I look at, you know, a guy like Daryl Henderson, who's been incredibly consistent for the Rams. I think the the issue has always been about his usage, Cam, because I'll be honest with you. I know the injuries are there. Um, but if you look, you know, Spotrack actually does this really cool thing with market value, where if a player is going to be a free agent, they basically break it all down and they give you like four or five guys in that tier. So uh, Spotrack was saying Daryl Henderson's on the same level as like Ronald Jones, you know, uh, Rashad Penny, Sony Michelle, those guys. And he played more games than all of them. Um, so, you know, I feel like he kind of, he gets put in this pre-existing pod of injury prone and he's kind of just a guy to people. But I mean, Henderson, here are the facts. Since 2019, when he came into the league, he was tied with Todd Gurley for yards per carry, the highest on the team. He has led in yards per carry every single year with the Rams. So I look at this running back room and we can obviously get to it later on the show about, you know, the flashiness, the player movement. But man, uh, do you have any idea why? I mean, obviously you, you haven't talked to Sean McVay about this, I assume. But like, I, I really, it's like mind blowing for me, Cam, when I'm watching this team and Daryl Henderson rips off a 16 yard run on a third and 15. That was very crucial against the Panthers. He had zero carries the game before. And he's not the one complaining about the touches. It's Cam Akers, who got 13 for 33. So it becomes really interesting because it's like, do they have the guy on this roster to actually right the ship, build this running back room up, build this running game up, help Stafford out, and it's just not being utilized correctly? 
and and sometimes, right? A lot of times when it comes to to sport, I'll break this down. I there's something as a professional player. A lot of times it, it happens top down, right? And so you got to look at the coordinator. You got to look at the run game coordinator. You got to look at those things that are kind of above those positions because at the end of the day, the athletes can only do so much. And so now we have to bring in the coaches. We have to bring in just the decision-making when it comes to, hey, I want you to carry out this play no matter who is out there on the field. And so I think that's that's really important. Um, and kind of going back to your point about about the Achilles thing with, with Akers, you know, after injuries, after injuries, athletes are never the same. You know, when I when I saw that, it reminded me of the Kevin Durant piece. I know, you know, his Achilles oh, went yeah. out during during the finals. And, you know, he's he's working his way back. But, like, is it still the same KD that it was before? Like, you know, we don't know. And so it, it plays as a, a mental a mental game that comes with, with that injury there. You can go to the Kobe Bryant or whatever that is. But, you know, going back to Cam Akers there, you know, I, I hope that – um, I, I know things come out in the ESPN and whatnot this this week, but I hope that uh, they're able to find a solution. And I, I love what Sean McVay said about it. He was just saying like, hey, you know, it would make sense if we had a fresh start for Cam Akers on another team. He's like, but if that doesn't happen, we'll figure something out here. And, and I really liked Sean McVay's approach there. It, it seemed like it was very open minded to figure out a solution. And, and so you mentioned Henderson. He's He's been a staple. He's been very consistent. And so <laughs> I kind of look at Henderson almost as like he's like that, uh, I want to say the side chick, but like you kind of like keep, keep to the side, but like it's not like that main focus, you know? And so I think in this situation, it's like, hey, like you got to pay the side chick a little bit more attention, bring him to the front and make him the main, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, Henderson is is making plays for this team, like you said, and, and this the second half of the last game. I mean, the man showed out. I mean, the man showed out. He was running the ball, moving the football, moving the chains. And so I think that's extremely important. And it's time for Henderson to get some love there. I absolutely agree with you. And before we get into the wide receivers, I'll just say my analogy I always use about this because it's, you know, postseason baseball time. And I just think of him as a contact hitter. You know, he's not flashy. I'm a Yankee fan. All Yankee fans want home runs. I'll be honest with you. I'm okay with the Isaiah Kiner Falefa. If you don't know who he is, he's just a contact hitter, right? He's not, he doesn't hit home runs, but he gets on base. That's what I want. I don't need a guy that's going to strike out 200 times a year. I want a guy that's going to get on base. And that's really, you know, Henderson does all the things extremely well. I would make this argument. I think he is the best pass protector at running back in the league. And it is not even close. I watch him and I'm like, this guy is like a mini offensive line. The mirroring, the footwork, it's really impressive. So I'm hoping, and we'll get into, you know, Christian McCaffrey and all the big names, you know, in the, the next segment. But I am hoping they do use him more as kind of a poor man's Alvin Kamara before they write off what he can fully do for this team. Uh, moving into the receiver room, this has been kind of a surprise, okay? The Rams were dealt kind of a bad deck early on when we found out, look, Van Jefferson, I don't know what's going on, but he's not going to be ready for week one against the Bills. And now all of a sudden, he's on IR. And then you're like, wait, so Van Jefferson, if you told me before the season, Cam, that Van Jefferson wasn't going to play his first game until week eight, I would have been a little surprised by that. Um, actually, very. <laughs> so... You know, it starts off with that, and you know what he can do over the top, 4-3 speed. The guy is, you know, he's really good. Um, then you go out and you get Allen Robinson. You spend $15 million a year on him, and, I mean, I'll say this, I don't think they've used him correctly up until the Carolina game where they finally, finally threw two, finally. You, know, you know, jump balls up to him, right? Uh, Cooper Cup, who's the best receiver in football, and I think that conversation... <laughs> It, it's starting to get to the point, Cam, where that conversation is going to kind of bleed into all time. Where does this guy fit all time? Because right now, I don't think it's really close. When you watch him play, you're like, yeah, he's on a bad foot, 85 yards. He had the 22-yard the gain on the third and long bubble screen where Sean McVay at that point is basically just admitting defeat. We're going to punt the ball and Cooper Cup gets the first down. You know, So it's like the receiver room, they have plenty of talent. You know, Tutu Atwell is a second round pick, has all the speed in the world. I want to see him utilize more in the second half of the season. Uh, I know Lance McCutcheon got everyone's blood pumping in the preseason. I can't see him playing much this year if he hasn't already played. I think the big surprise, or not really a surprise, because I've kind of felt like this was going to happen, but I've just loved to watch the emergence of Ben Skoranek. I, I feel like just 
he has been so fun to watch, whether he's at fullback, which is genius of Sean McVay, by the way, and, uh, you know, wide receiver. And he said, you know, Tyler Higby took him under his wing. So it doesn't surprise me that the blocking is there. I'm sure he could line up in line at tight end. But, uh, I mean, I could go for days with this receiver room. But, you know, what are your thoughts so far going through the first six weeks? Yeah, you mentioned the going Skoranek, right? I, I mean, seeing him in the backfield, um, creating mismatches. I think that's a big thing for him is he'll be able to create mismatches. Uh, mis mismatches. You think about like a, a, a Kyle Ju a Jusic from, from the 49ers, fullback number yeah. 44. And you see him operate. He creates a lot of mismatches uh, when it comes to linebacker, safeties, whoever it is. And so I, I see the same thing for Skoranek where he can come out of the backfield, run a couple wheel routes, you know, uh, hit, hit a couple um, routes out from the backfield. I think it's going to be really important for the Rams. Um, and then, like you said, Cooper Cup, man. I mean, this the guy is unbelievable. Just the way – just pay attention to this next time you watch the game, Jake. Like after a big hit or someone talks trash to him, just watch his response to a lot of those things. Oh, or even I know. a big, a big play. I mean, the man is like, it's not too high, not too low for him. He's just like right in the middle. His focus is, is it seems unmatched. Um, and he's like somebody, somebody call it. He's a, he's a sneaky athlete, you know, like, you know, it doesn't seem like he'll run away from you, but the moment he catches that football, I mean, he is on the edge of a lot of defenses. And so, uh, you know, my hat, my hat off to Cooper Cup playing injured like that's that's hard to do it. And you you mentioned Jefferson there. Um, I have a quick story about him when I played against him. Uh, he was when he was at Penn State and I was at Syracuse. So this so he happened to be out um, the first the first half of a Penn State Syracuse game, and our defensive coordinator they didn't they didn't uh, account for him. Um, on the back end of the game. And so when he got in the game, he absolutely took over. And so to see him finally be used, um, to, to see him finally be used, sorry, Allen Robinson, to see him finally be used in the Panthers game, um, I was like, okay, like, you know, we're cooking. The guy, like, You have pictures on ESPN of this guy high-pointing the ball, I mean, looking like a ballerina, you know, like Allen Robinson. It, and it's, it's, very, it's very cool to see him emerge in that way. So... I hope this uh, this this uh, this here bye week they're they're drawing up plays for Allen Robinson, uh, you know, back to back, complimenting with Cooper Cup, uh, and then also the run game as well, right? For Allen Robinson to get the football, they have to be able to run the ball effectively to open the game up for him because we know Cooper Cup's going to get it. So, right, uh, yeah, oh, you yeah. know, figure figure out the run game, you know, make sure the offensive line are healthy, and then you can get Allen Robinson that football and, and ha allow him to compete the way he did. I absolutely agree. And I actually had a bold prediction coming into this year. I thought he was going to lead the league in receiving. I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like if they used him the way they wanted to or the way I expected them to and Van was healthy, I think he might have because I thought everyone would have turned their attention to Cooper Cup and it would have opened up the door for him. But when you have, you know, like Allen Robinson pretty much this year has just been running those out routes. He's been running digs. He's been running curls. And it's like, that's not really his game. It's not saying that he can't do that, but you know, you want to use him in those 50, 50 ball situations because first off Stafford gives everyone an opportunity in those situations. He's just going to tell you to go up and get it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, look, this is a guy that turns a 50, 50 ball into an 80, 20 ball. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, he's just that guy and he's been doing it since Blake Bortles was this quarterback when he dropped 1400 yards on the year with Blake Bortles, which I do think is very impressive. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I was definitely wrong. He's probably not going to lead the league in receiving unless he has, like, the craziest end to the season ever, which I'm here for, by the way, Alan. Please do that. Uh, but but I, I don't know. I, I think you're right. You definitely got to start drawing stuff up for him. And I think just the... The ability of Van Jefferson, having him back, I think it's going to allow them so much more creative freedom uh, within their scheme. Uh, but looking at the offensive line, something that might not offer so much creative freedom in their scheme if they don't get it figured out. Uh, the offensive line has started six different combinations. We'll start their seventh different combination week eight against the 49ers. They've had 10 different starters on the offensive line. Last year, Cam, believe it or not, they did battle some injuries, 
But the offensive line that started week one last almost half the season or longer than half the season, that's the first thing. The second thing is they had six starting combinations all year. And the Rams are going to pass that in week eight. So when people say this offensive line is trash, and you know, you and I talked about, I don't like saying that word about players. But when people say that, I'm sitting here like, well, do we even know what this offensive line is? Because I hate to break it to you. No booms hurt. Edwards is, you know, he went to Pittsburgh to get further evaluation on his concussion, kind of like what Cooks went through back when he was with the Rams. Uh, You know, Brian Allen has been banged up, right? You know, you're not going to have Ankrum. He's out for the year. So like all these guys are hurt. And, you know, Coleman Shellen's hurt as well. And it's like to say that the offensive line is bad is just not really fair because it's a makeshift offensive line right now. It's not the opening day. It's not what they prepared going into the season. This is not what they expected. I mean, there's no way Sean McVay was sitting there like, yeah, you know, I'll say this right now. Jeremiah Cologne, you you know, you were about to go in the police academy. Well, in three weeks, you'll be our starting center. Like, I don't think he thought that that was going to happen. I don't think he thought any of this was going to happen. And I know the Rams couldn't have seen... Uh, And this is another thing that I'm kind of bothered by when I hear fans complain about, well, they didn't go out and try to get anybody on the offensive line. They drafted with the highest pick in their draft. They drafted Logan Bruss. He tore his ACL in preseason. Like, I mean, that's just a freak thing. You know, (laughs) you you drafted an offensive lineman to help you and he tore his ACL. You know, I mean, it's stuff like that that's out of your control. But, you know, what are your thoughts on this offensive line coming here into the, uh, the bye week? Yeah, you mentioned Cologne, right? Stepping off of um, police training and stepping onto the football <laughs> field to be the center. Now, I, you know, I play linebacker. And so on the defensive side, you know, we pay attention to a lot, a lot of times to the center and the quarterback, right? Because they're the, they're the center of the offense, essentially. And so the offensive linemen, they're responsible for calling out protections. And the center, that's, that's a lot to take on, right? Like, that's like that you have to you have to know the whole playbook. You have to understand what the defense is doing as well. And it's a lot of pressure. And so giving the offensive line some time, right? I know the Rams fans are like, oh, we need to change things up. Uh, Offensive line is whatever it is. Giving the offensive line some time to gel, right? Um, A lot of great offensive linemen, sometimes they don't have to talk and they know where things are going just off of body language or cadence or just being together. And so allowing this offensive line some grace and some time to figure it out. I think it's going to be really important. I know they only allowed one sack, I believe, versus the Panthers. I know a couple of weeks before that, they were in the, you know, the fours, the threes, the the sevens. Uh, You go to the Dallas game. So I think it's really important for the Rams fans to find some grace for this offensive line. Um, And I think also believe that in this bye week that the Rams and Sean McVay, they're going to figure it out, right? Um, You have to make adjustments and, you know, given this bye week, it's crucial because think about it for a season. You got, you have OTAs that start April, you have training camp that goes the whole summer and then you have the season. So they, these athletes, they've already gone through a lot at at this point. So, you know, with this bye week, they get, they get to rest, right? They get to call the family members that they haven't had a chance to speak to since April or whenever that was for being so busy. And so, it gives this offensive line time to to get together right outside of the facility, you know, hey, go eat together, go, you know, go play golf together, figure out how to get some chemistry going. And then, you know, coming to the 49ers game, I think uh, in the following week, they're going to be a lot better. They're going to be on the same page. They're gonna be, there's going to be a lot more uh, synchronization between the offensive line. But to the Rams fan, Rams fan out there, give grace, <laughs> give grace there. <laughs> Hey, I'm I'm with you. And, you know, before we get into uh, the defense, which, uh, you know, very well, um, I do have to give a shout out to Alaric Jackson because it's just very rare that you get a UDFA like that, like yourself. I mean, hey, UDFAs are not a guarantee, right? They're not. I mean, we are we all know that all UDFAs are talented. I mean, they are. There's only a lotted amount of draft picks in the draft. And we see it all the time. The Rams love undrafted rookie free agents. But this Alaric Jackson kid could end up being their bookend left tackle of the future. And they might have just found that because of multitude of injuries. I mean, if you think about this, they got Alaric Jackson out of Iowa. Tristan Wirfs, who you know for, you know, Tampa, 
Uh, Tristan Wirfs is the best right tackle in football. Uh, I, I don't know if that's even a discussion. I mean, he is a monster. Well, he was starting at right tackle and Alec Jackson was starting at left tackle at Iowa. And I feel like people forget that. And Alaric Jackson went undrafted. And the Rams liked him so much, they considered trading up in, back into the draft and taking him. But instead, they were very excited to sign him to a deal. They gave him extra money to make sure that, you know, he would sign with them. And then he makes the roster. And you're like, okay, that's a really good start. I mean, the Rams keep UDFAs on the roster. They kept a few this year. And I just feel like when you you look at it, getting a guy like that, he comes in last year on a Super Bowl roster. And no boom goes down. Whitworth is down. So this guy has to come in and win football games or help you win football games, protect Matthew Stafford, who you just gave all those picks up for. So that's a there's a lot of pressure on this young kid. And he comes through. And then this year, you know, he's been playing right guard because they had injuries immediately when the season started. And now he moves to left tackle. And no boom goes down middle of this game against the Panthers. He doesn't allow a pressure, not one pressure. I understand people will say it's the Panthers, but I don't think you've been paying attention to the Panthers. If you're just going to say it's just the Panthers, just because their team isn't very good and their direction and they fired the defense coordinator and their head coach and their special team does not mean that they don't have a pass rush, which by the way, right now has 99 pressures on the year through six games. That's pretty good. The Rams don't even have 60. So we're going to talk it. That's there's a kind of a, a segue into the Rams defense, which I got to say, Raheem Morris has put on absolute masterclass with only having what 54 pressures on the year on the quarterback. I mean, he's done an, an outstanding job, but I'm curious what you think about the defense. And I guess starting with the defensive line and then going into your, your number one uh, position there, linebacker. Yeah, yeah. So going to the defensive line here, um, you know, I've been watching these past couple of games with the Rams. And of course, you know, you're watching Aaron Donald, right? Like anyone who's played with Aaron, anyone who's watched Aaron, it's like, hey, when you cut the TV on, you watch the Rams, let's see what this man is doing. And so with Aaron, I'm not sure if he's able right now to <clears throat> with without other major weapons, right? You, you know, there's a there's been a big change on the de that defensive line. You got Sebastian jo Joseph Day. Uh, you got your Von Miller. They all went different places, and so now all the teams are, are just focusing on Aaron Donald with with this piece. And so, what I would like to see out of the Rams defensive line is being more anchored in the run game. Period. That's just just one thing. Being more anchored. You know, watching this Panthers game seeing that defensive line, that line of scrimmage get pushed back, every, mostly every snap in that first that first half, it, it was hard to watch. It was hard to watch. And really to win football games, the it starts at that line of scrimmage. And, and if the D-line cannot stop the run game, that's, I mean, that's like running like a marathon with a, 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 just a big pound, a big weight on your back. I mean, it's hard. It's hard in football to do really well if you can't stop the ball from run, uh, stop the run game or even get the ball going in the run game. And so that's what I would like to see from this Rams defensive line is to see some more anchor, see some more anchor and not allow that, that, um, that line of scrimmage to move. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they had shown some good things, but then, you know, you go to the Dallas Cowboys and you get, like, just the, the missed gap assignment, you know, on the Powell, or not Powell, I keep calling him Powell, uh, Tony Pollard. <laughs> they had the Tony Pollard 50-plus yard run. And then, you know, they held Zeke Elliott in check, but I feel like that kind of, those bad tendencies that they developed in that game kind of carried over into this one. You saw Christian McCaffrey immediately just take advantage of it. And uh, while they didn't score a touchdown, I mean, McCaffrey still had a big day, you know? And so I agree with you. Um, I think it was a little weird because this game, it wasn't really announced to us, but Greg Gaines was dealing with a shoulder. And so they were actually using a UDFA out of Cincinnati, who I really like, Marquise Copeland. I think he's done an incredible job uh, just developing under Eric Henderson, um, the defensive uh, line coach. And I just think he's done a great job of that. He had a sack in this game. Uh, Ashawn Robinson's been really good against the run this year. So they have some guys, but I think really the the main issue with Donald is like you had to notice, you know, against the Cowboys, they were using him at edge because they don't have an edge rusher 
on the level of, well, even last year's Leonard Floyd. I mean, Leonard Floyd dealt with an, a knee coming into this year, and I feel like it's still bothering him. We'll see coming out of the bye. Maybe he gets things going, but maybe he doesn't have a good year. And if that's the case, you know, the Rams kind of have a lot riding on him because the other side, you know, you have Justin Hollins, who I like a lot, and uh, you have Terrell Lewis, but those guys really haven't done a ton, right? Uh, and when you look at Justin Hollins, the guy is very athletically gifted, but he's always been a run defender first. Like, this is a guy that sets the edge. When you look at Terrell Lewis, it's all about potential. It's all about this guy on one rep could look like the best pass rusher in the league, and on the next, he's, I don't know where he is. You know, and so I think there there needs to be more consistency there, which is why in our next segment, talking about trades and such, I definitely think that they're, they're going to need to look and get something going. Like you mentioned with Donald, you got to get him some help. And, you know, Bobby Brown is coming out of the, the bye. Uh, he is actually going to be on the roster. He was suspended because of PEDs. So he will be back. Um, and that's a big deal because he's a fourth round pick in 2020 who they are 2021, who they really like and they want to get him going. So, you know, you have those guys. It's great. But I still feel like the biggest issue with Donald right now is that, you know, you don't have a Von Miller, and I get that, but they were still putting on pressure without Von before they got him. Right now, they are in the bottom of the league cam in quarterback pressures. They have 56, I'm looking at it right now, 56 and 12 sacks, which that's a pretty good 12 sacks is not bad at this point in the season, but 56 pressures and 12 sacks. The next 66 pressures, the Chicago Bears, after that, the Raiders have 67, the Saints have 69, and the Texans have 72. It's not really acceptable right now because it's forcing the defensive coordinator, Raheem Morris's hand so much. It's forcing a secondary that was without three of their top four corners for the last three weeks. You know, it becomes a lot. And I've heard people say, you know, offense line's more important. We need to go out and get an offensive lineman because, you know, defense is still eating. Yes, but now you're going to be playing Tom Brady. You're going to be playing Aaron Rodgers. You're going to be playing Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray again, Russell Wilson, Derek. I mean, let's Patrick Mahomes. Let's just remember pressure's good. We we like pressure yes. on the quarterback. Definitely. So let's not just be okay with being last in the league in pressure. And let's look at potentially solving the issues. But I've been talking enough. What What do you think? Uh, you know, kind of moving on to the linebackers here, which we could also add the edge defenders. Uh, you know, how were you kind of taking the first six weeks? And, you know, what are your thoughts on on this position group? Yeah, so as you know, Bob, we all know Bobby Wagner is here at the Rams, and that, that's been a great addition. Um, you know, I, I was at the Rams and the Buffalo Bills game. Um, you know, I was there when Bobby and Josh Allen uh, met at the goal line, right? Like, and so seeing Bobby Wagner play when he's at the Seattle Seahawks and then seeing him now, it, there, there's a little difference there, right? And, and so um, one thing one thing with Bobby that I would love to see are some of those game-breaker plays, right? Some of those where it's like strip sack, um, you know, hit stick where the ball comes out. You know, I know he, he hit stick one of those fans that were running on the field. They were, you know, had the little uh, pink can uh, canister out there. But I, I would love to see some of those game changing plays by, from Bobby Wagner. Right. You know, you know, uh, with Jalen Ramsey, you see a lot of those like, ooh, type plays where a big hit on Christian McCaffrey, the sack of the, like you see those like game breaking plays. I would love to see that from the linebacking core. Right. Because. Um, you know, it, it is a struggle when sometimes the defensive line, they're not really getting pressure and, you know, they're getting knocked back into your lap like that. Is, that is, that's very tough sometimes. But I would like to see that superstar come out of Bobby Wagner. I think that's what this Rams Rams team needs. They need that 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 spark, that flash. I think Aaron Donald needs it. I think Jalen Ramsey needs it. So I, I would love to see that um, from the Rams linebacking core. And then also to creating, you know, creating more turnovers, you know, as a linebacker group, continue to create more turnovers. I think that's going to help. That's going to help a lot of things out. So, you know, we'll see. But I'm looking for that this 49ers game. You know, you, you got a great linebacking core over there at the 49ers. I think it's going to be big for the Rams to show up this game, this this upcoming game in two weeks and show that, that hey, you know, we run we run the uh, the NFC when it comes to uh, linebacker play. 
Yeah, it's going to be very important. I think you got probably one of the best games of Ernest Jones' career uh, out of him against the Panthers. He just seemed like he was on another level in that game. Uh, kind of similar to the Super Bowl against the the Bengals. I mean, you know, having the fourth and one uh, pass breakup was huge. It kind of you know set the tone early on, and then you know the the blitz right up the you know right up the gap, uh, just leveling Joe Mixon, uh, who was in pass pro and getting the quarterback. You know, I think this guy has a huge chance to be a star, and I think getting Bobby Wagner, part of that was, yes, it's Bobby Wagner, but also part of that was developing Ernest Jones. Um, and I think, you know, Wagner's gotten a lot of hate, I think. You know, there are a lot of people that are like, he's washed, he's, you know, my favorite word, trashed, but... I disagree, man. Um, you know, I agree with you is that, you know, he's played well. We just want to see more of the superstar moments. You know, we want to, this is somebody that like you could not throw near him. If you were the 49ers, it was like, you watch a Seattle and San Francisco game. And it was like, he just had a nose for the football anywhere. It was, he would come down with it. I remember one specifically. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but like he tipped the ball to himself, dove and like caught his own tip. I mean, it's just stuff like that where, I understand he's getting a little bit, you know, older, but I feel like he's still capable of making those plays. And I know, you know, you get more pressure on the quarterback and those plays become more uh, possible to even happen. But looking at the secondary, I'm just so impressed with the secondary right now. I really am because they held the Cardinals with that high powered offense. I know D hop is out and he'll be back today, Uh, but he was, he was out in the game. I get it. But, the Cardinals had 81 plays and they did not score a touchdown. And a lot of that is because I know people don't like the bend, don't break defense. It's not flashy, but it's working. And, you know, they didn't do it as much against the Panthers. They really didn't do it at all because PJ Walker's longest throw air yards was one yard. <laughs> yeah. A lot of screen so passes. Yeah. Everything was behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, I just think it's a, it's a testament to how Jonathan Cooley, is, you know, Coach Cooley is really, you know, building this this secondary up and, and developing these young guys. I mean, think about it. Darion Kendrick's ready. He comes off the practice squad, not practice squad, inactive list uh, first two weeks. And now all of a sudden, they're like, all right, Darion, it's all yours. Like, you just, you know, and, and he's, he's playing well. And then you look, you know, David Long gets hurt. So in steps Grant Haley, you know, and Grant Haley plays well. And it's just like, it's a constant revolving door of just, good cornerback play, you're going to get healthy because Troy Hill's going to be coming back out of the bye, according to McVay, who I'm very excited about. I'm, I believe he was around when you were yep. there. Uh, yep. I feel like he's been with the Rams forever. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, you got Troy Hill. Jacoby Durant looks like an absolute stud. Um, so you have those guys. But then you have Jalen Ramsey. So you have all these guys that are playing better than maybe people would anticipate. And then you have Jalen Ramsey... That's going to make their job easier, but also they're going to make Jalen Ramsey's job easier because now he can go out and roam and he can make that play on Christian McCaffrey. He can blow up bubble screens and he can blitz the quarterback and get his first two sacks of his career back-to-back weeks. So I think a lot of that is a testament to how well these guys are playing. And it's also saying a lot, Cam, because what I don't think is being talked about enough is the safeties have been banged up. I mean, they draft Quentin Lake in the sixth round out of UCLA and you know, he doesn't even get a chance to play. He had to have knee surgery and we don't know when he'll be back. If he is back, uh, they go out and they get uh Russ yeast. Who's been a great special teamer, but he's just not ready to take on a significant role in the defense. You know, Terrell Burgess, Taylor Rapp's been banged up. Unfortunately, Jordan Fuller, you know, you look at what he's done in his young career and now he's battling injury. He's on the IR. So now it's Nick Scott, a guy, and I know I just mentioned Grant Haley, you mentioned Allen Robinson, so many Penn State guys on this roster, uh, but Nick Scott's a guy they drafted in the seventh round in 2019 as insurance to you know their second round pick in Taylor Rapp, and I mean, he's outperforming Rapp, so you know there's a lot of stuff here where they've had to do more, and they've been tested, and you can look at three and three any way you want. You can say it's a failure, you can say it's disappointing, but the bottom line is, as Sean McVay continues to say, the story's not written yet. And on top of that, they have the buy at the right time. They can get healthy now going into week eight. They're three and three. I mean, you could say however you want, but I think they're very, they, they could be five and one, Cam. They absolutely could be. The defense played well enough. 
But with the offense not playing well and still being three and three, that's another way to look at it. And so I, I don't mind that they're three and three. I think it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good position to be in Tampa's there. Green Bay's there. The 49ers are there. A lot of good teams are three and three right now. The league is crazy. Just, you know, running with parody everywhere. Yeah. And it's early. It's early. Like you said, I mean, you know, you see the, uh, you see, I did play for the Buccaneers. So you see the Buccaneers a few years ago, right? Where they, they started off a little shaky and they figured it out, you know? And I feel like with the Rams, the offensive line, they're going to figure it out. Um, and then you talked about, you know, go back to the backfield for the, for the DBs to see the DBs, um, their leadership in Jalen Ramsey, right? Like, when he raises his game and his leadership, it, it raises everyone else, right? So he gives them the tips and the tricks to be successful in the back, you know, in that back in there. And they're all playing well, like you said. And, and then going back to the Bobby Wagner piece, his leadership skills, the way he's able to make the game easier for anyone that's playing around him, he brings that value to the game. And that's something that a lot of people don't really see, right? The communication skills, the leadership skills, whatever that is, he brings to the field. And so, you know, it, it is very early. The Rams are 500 to three and three right now. They have, they have their buy. They can still be dangerous, right? If they figure out this run game, they figure out how to get Allen Robinson that football, they could still be dangerous. And so, like I said, I would love to see a few more takeaways from the linebacker group just because I'm a linebacker as well. You know, Bobby Wagner, he's he's that that legend in this space. And so I would love to see him have some big splash plays coming up, but the Rams can still be very dangerous. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think this is the team that, you know, hey, they won the Super Bowl. They're going to get everyone's best shot. You know, they got a giant X painted on their back. And I think that's also kind of forgotten here. So maybe their three and three is almost more impressive than a Green Bay Packers three and three, right? Because, you know, the Rams are getting everyone's best shot. You, you know, everyone is going in there like in order to be the best, you got to beat the best. So like, you know, the way the Bills came out in that game, I haven't seen the Bills play with that intensity the whole year since. I mean, like, they have still, they've blown out teams worse, but they haven't played with that intensity that they showed against the Rams. And so you could tell, like, they, they were out to really, you know, beat the best, right? So I do think that there, there's something real about that. I think that's why, you know, could cause, it, albeit it was a little fluky, you know, a lot of stuff had to go their way, but it could have caused, you know, the Falcons to be in that game at the end. I mean, you know, it, it kind of gives you a second wind almost, uh, you know, sometimes you're able to stifle a team like Arizona, um, but sometimes you're not. And so, you know, it's very interesting, uh, you know, with that, but going into the the final aspect of this podcast and, and talking about what really everyone loves is player movement. I mean, we, <laughs> you, you, you laughed when I brought that up, but I mean, it, it's true, right? I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know how like messed up it is. Cause I mean, it's a bunch of, you know, players. It's a bunch of human beings that now have to decide. Like, it's like they're changing teams. They're like getting new jobs and everyone's so like hyped for it. You know, in a way, it's kind of weird when you look at it like that. But player movement's always been a thing. Like you look at the trade deadline, even though the NFL trade deadline isn't as active, people go crazy over the idea of it. Free agency. I mean, I I'm you know, guilty of this. I have all the alerts on my phone. So I find, you know, everyone going everywhere, you know, you want to follow it. Uh, it's the league that never sleeps. So with that being said, even though this isn't, you know, the MLB trade deadline or the NBA trade deadline, where there's way more trades, there's still been some trades over the last few years. And I think the Rams especially have really shown you that they're not afraid to go out. If they're missing a pass rusher, all right, we'll go out and get Dante Fowler. We'll go out and get Von Miller. You know, we, we need this guy. We'll go out and get him. We'll sign OBJ. I mean, all sorts of stuff comes out. But looking at, you know, the trade options, I'm going to ask you first, Cam, if there, give me three positions. If you had to pick three, what position groups are you looking at to, I guess, not necessarily upgrade, but like position groups you're looking at the trade deadline to at least add to a room? Definitely. O-line, right? We talked about it. O-line, I, I know they need some time to get together, but getting getting someone in there as soon as we can to to, to firm that up. So O-line, I would like D-line as well. Uh, that would be amazing. And then as you as you know, the running back group, that's those, those three things. I mean, O-line and D-line, <clears throat> where the Rams are now, being 500, 
that line of scrimmage is the most important thing that they can take care of. And so protecting that line of scrimmage by getting upgrades, quote unquote, at those positions would be would be the first the first line of duty. And then at the running back spot as well. I'm seeing some folks on this list and uh, I'm pretty excited to dive into them. But those are the three positions that I think would, would need a little upgrade there. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Um, you know, I think when you look at, for instance, the running backs to start off, everyone is going to gravitate towards Christian McCaffrey. And obviously we can confirm that the Rams offered a deal to Christian McCaffrey. We don't know what the deal is. Uh, I predict it's a second and a fourth, if I'm being honest. But uh, I know that Peter Schrager was, you know, reporting that, you know, they're looking for two first round picks. I think that's a little egregious. I don't think they're going to get that. Not for a running back in this, not in this day and age where everyone's saying running backs don't matter. Although, ironically, Cam, the people that were saying running backs don't matter want their team to trade for Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> uh, it's funny how that works. But, you know, you look at Christian McCaffrey, I think another option here, a potential Cam Akers swap for Melvin Gordon. I mean, Denver needs a running back. And, you know, unfortunately with Javante Williams, who is an incredible talent, he goes down. They're still a team that does feel like they're in it, even though they don't feel like they're in it right now. But, I mean, the Rams are kind of going through the same thing. I mean, you got to, you know, work through this long season. And so, you know, if you think, hey, you know, we have, you know, the carries for Cam Akers and we believe that maybe the Rams weren't using him the right way and we can, you go out and you get, you know, Akers and Gordon, somebody that you like, but maybe he's overstayed his welcome. Maybe we shouldn't have brought him back. It's not really a fit. You send him over to the Rams and he's back in L.A., uh, where he was with the Chargers. And I mean, yes, you know, people talk about the fumbling issues, but I think if you manage him well enough, I don't think that'll be a big deal because you have Henderson and then you can use Gordon as kind of like, you know, a guy that could come in and kind of be like your change of pace. And almost in a way, like normally you would have the bigger back be that, but I feel like Henderson has more of the well-rounded game at this point in his career. But at the same time, Gordon's a hell of a two to have cam because He's coming off two back-to-back 900-yard seasons in last year, splitting time with the, you know, very exciting rookie running back that I mentioned, Javante Williams. Um, I know people want Kareem Hunt. I I don't think he's the guy that the Browns are looking at getting rid of. I actually think it's Dearness Johnson. Uh, So he's an option. Antonio Gibson's an option uh, because they absolutely love Brian Robinson. And I'll be honest, I think everyone in America loves Brian Robinson because of his story. Um, and then David Montgomery is an interesting one. I put him on the list as well as Ronald Jones. Jones was like this guy. If you were a fantasy football fan, you're like Ronald Jones in the, in Kansas city. I mean, that's going to be a dream. He hasn't gotten a carry yet this year. And I don't think that's going to change, uh, was a healthy scratch, not a good look. Um, I do think he's talented enough to be, you know, an actual, you know, back in this league. Uh, I think, you know, his, you know, resume shows that. Um, he showed that in Tampa and, uh, David Montgomery is another guy where, you know, you look over the the Khalil Herbert has the best yards per carry average in the NFL. And it's like kind of hard to justify why you wouldn't give him the ball over Montgomery with the way he's running it. Montgomery is also kind of a big name. You know, he was the pick they got after the Khalil Mack trade where pretty much they emptied all of their draft picks. And so they could only draft a running back. So, I mean, out of those guys, Cam, are there anybody like is there anybody that you realistically think the Rams could actually add to this team? Well, I'll go. I'll go with the dream pick. I'll go with the dream pick, and then I'll also go with the pick that may not be likely, but you know, I would like to see as well. Um, so the dream pick, of course, would be Cream Hunt. I mean, you know, the guy's playing with Nick Chubb. Uh, iron sharpens iron at the end of the day, and so if he stays healthy, you know, coming coming to the Rams like that that could be a big addition. Uh, and going back to the, the Christian McCaffrey piece, I mean, my my man, he's 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 a generational player. I would say, right? He can catch the ball, he can run the ball, he can. And back in college, he was returning the ball, but my man, my man gets hurt a lot, and so. And that, that's always with the running with the running back space. But uh, an ideal for me, a dream one for me, would be a Kareem Hunt to to see him run that ball um, in a Rams uniform would be amazing. And then going back to your other point with Ronald Jones, right? Ronald Jones is a USC guy. He's an LA guy, so that might add a little bit more juice to what he's bringing to the table. Um, and I remember for Ronald Jones, you know, catching the ball in the backfield is, is a little trouble. So you know, being at the Chiefs. You know, being able to catch the ball in the backfield, that might be a, a thing for him. And so, but 
Ronald Jones playing with him, seeing him break, you know, 80-yard runs, 70-yard runs, because he used to be a track guy, you know, that can add that speed factor, you know, to the Rams as well. Um, and so if I had to give my two, you know, a Kareem Hunt at the top end, Ronald Jones at the bottom end, that, that's what I would look at for me. And then also, too, for Christian McCaffrey, right? Like, you know, if you can if you can shoot for Christian McCaffrey, like, <laughs> come on, like, you got to. And hopefully he stays healthy. That will be my biggest thing, right? It's like you aim for Christian McCaffrey. He's hurt again. Now you're back to where we are, you know, from the original, uh, from the original lineup. So. That's why I go back to say, see a Malcolm Brown in that room, regardless, he's going to be able to help out with a lot of that stuff. He might not be your front guy, but he's going to be able to help some of the new offensive linemen who really don't know pretty protections or whatever that is. Say, hey, guys, like, no, we got to count the linebacker over here, over there. So that's that's my prediction on that. I like that. And, and you played with Ronald Jones, right? right? Yep. Yep. So you play with Ronald Jones and you play with Todd Gurley. Yes. Now, I want to ask you. And this is no disrespect because I love Todd Gurley. I, I I wish I curse the football gods for for injury. <laughs> but uh, getting Christian McCaffrey is that like having that Todd Gurley offense again? Like if he stays healthy, is that like the same thing? Would we see Sean McVay be able to seemingly have every opportunity now with the offense opened up wide open, regardless of the offensive line, or is it a little different? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, I think they're a different type of style back. But to your point about Sean McVay and it opening up the playbook, when people play Christian McCaffrey, like regardless if he's healthy or not, like the defensive coordinator has to change the game plan. When Alvin Kamara is playing, like you got to change the game plan because he might he could possibly be in a slot lined up against a linebacker one on one like that could be trouble. Right. And same thing with Christian McCaffrey. If he's in the backfield and it just, there's a different can of worms when it comes to players like this. So with Christian McCaffrey, it would open up the playbook big time for Sean McVay, right? And then when that opens up the playbook for Sean McVay, that means more to Cooper Cup, more to Allen Robinson, right? And, and Christian McCaffrey, he can change the dynamic of, of a game by being healthy. So um, that adds that adds a lot of uh, a lot of ammo. And then, you know, uh, with with Odell Beckham possibly coming in later, then you got some more you got some more weapons there. So, um, yeah, th there's there's a lot to do when Christian McCaffrey comes in the game. It, it's just a different world for, for a lot of coordinators. Yeah, I, I kind of liken it, and I've already said this on, you know, the podcast, but I kind of liken it to, you know, going out and getting Vaughn last year because what Vaughn Miller did was open up things for Floyd and Donald and so forth. And so you get McCaffrey, and it's like it opens up things for Cup and Robinson and Van and Daryl Henderson. I mean, I know Sean didn't use uh, Daryl Henderson and Cam Akers or Daryl Henderson and Todd Gurley in the same backfield and split back, even though I've been like ripping my hair out like to see it. But I feel like if they got Christian McCaffrey, they would use him and Henderson on the field at the same time because you can get all sorts of different looks there. And they both are, I mean, you might not realize this. Daryl Henderson is running the top five. He's in the top five most uh, routes run for a running back. So he's running on the same level as Christian McCaffrey and they're just not really using him, right? They're really using him as a decoy, which is bizarre. Uh, but I think that would kind of change everything if they went out and got him. Um, I would probably agree with you. I think Ronald Jones is incredibly low risk, high reward type of guy, a guy that's like, Hey, I signed here thinking I was going to get something here and I'm a healthy scratch. I know he hasn't like, you know, asked for a trade, but I'd be shocked if he hasn't already asked for a trade. It's just not out there. I mean, there's no way this guy's a competitor. I mean, we saw him at U USC. You saw him up close and personal in Tampa. I know Leonard Fournette got there and kind of pushed him out, but um, you know, Ronald Jones can play football in this league, no doubt about it. And so I think that would definitely be, you know, an option. I also think Dearness Johnson, who had to fill in at times last year. So there are a lot of options here for the Rams. I didn't mention Josh Jacobs because I don't know if the Raiders would do it, but if they were, because I do see they're interested in trading some guys, uh, you know, have mentioned Cleveland Farrell, who, uh, you know, they drafted in the first round and uh, Jonathan Abram from the previous regime. But if they were to trade Josh Jacobs and the Rams were able to get the two best running backs, in my opinion, from that class, that would be something else. I think Josh Jacobs and Daryl Henderson would be a perfect tandem. But looking at 
Uh, you mentioned the offensive line and then the edge. So we'll start with the offensive line. Uh, who are some players that you're looking at at the offensive line that you think are obtainable and you know could do something here for this team? Maybe even slide into the starting lineup um, and not just be a depth piece, or you know, however you have it. Just three guys that you know, if you have anybody in mind. Well, if anything, I'm always going to roll with with someone from the with someone from the Patriots. Uh, offensive line, right? Uh, anybody that that goes through that system and program, I'm sure, super disciplined. Um, so, I, you know, with that, with that, I, I'll roll um, with the, with your Isaiah Wynn, you know, from the Patriots. I have an old lineman there coming from that background. I think would be really important because this offensive line they would need that discipline. Um, and then also too, right? You got um, anybody from the Eagles, right? The Eagles' offensive line is always excellent. And when I look at this, when you think about trades. Not only their skill, but also what's what's up here and how they can positively affect the people around them. And, and so, you know, we have on the list here Andre Diller, Andre Diller, getting someone in there to positive to positively affect you know the situation that you're in. I think is going to be really important. And then uh, for the last one here, um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with my guy Cameron Irving uh, from the from the Panthers. Right. Um, this is a guy I know who. Play for the play for Florida State as well. I played I played against this guy at Florida State and he was really good there. And so having that that championship caliber player, people who have been there before, I think that's really really important. Because and the reason why I say that, you know, you have going back to the example with Tom Brady, going back to the Buccaneers, the the way he changed that locker room just by the way he he talked and the way he moved, it, it's. It's just a pot and a positive effect. And so to have people who have been there, done that before, I think it's going to be really, really important. And, and I, I'm going to pass it to you. I you definitely break down the, the numbers and the X's and O's when it comes to just their stats and what they put up. So curious to hear what you think. Yeah, you know, I like the three that you picked. Um, man, I'm a big fan of Isaiah Wynn, just not as a player, but also as a person. Uh, one of my first actual interviews in person at the Senior Bowl. So, like, we actually sat down and talked. And, I mean... I wanted the Rams to pick him that year. And funny enough, the Rams had a first round pick. They traded that away to the Patriots for Brandon Cooks and the Patriots picked Isaiah Wynn with that pick. So uh, it would be cool if they were able to grab him. Um, you know, the, the Rams and Patriots have a little bit of a relationship here. They had to trade with them to trade up and get Daryl Henderson in 2019. They've traded with them plenty of times before. And I know they traded with them to get Sony Michelle. So there might be, you know, obviously Bill Belichick's like the GM there. So he might have, you know, some sort of understanding with less need. And I always look at things like that before we, you know, do those dream trades. I mean, does a GM versus another GM have that, you know, experience trading with each other? And I think the Patriots do. And I'll say this, I wouldn't mind them throwing in an edge in uh, Josh Uche as well. A guy that I really like, uh, loved him coming out of Michigan. Um, I would really like that. But you know, I would, I'll agree with you. I think Isaiah Wynn is also likely too. like, I think if you're going to go out and get a guy, you get Wynn, who's played big time games in college. He's played big time games with the Patriots. He can play left tackle. He can play any of the guard spots. Uh, he can play right tackle. When you have a guy that can play four out of the five positions on an offensive line, that's been makeshift and has been very, very banged up. That is a good thing. Uh, the first, like the perfect recipe here is the fact that it's very simple uh, when you look at Isaiah Wynn, he just simply is not having a good year. And before the season, he talked about wanting to get out of New England. He wants a fresh start. He wants a change of scenery. Going to the Rams, I think, offers him that opportunity. But to also play for a championship and not necessarily go to a team where now I have to go through a rebuild. So I agree with you uh, in listing him. Very like I love that, actually. Um, Cameron Irving is an interesting one here because the whole Panthers offensive line, I think is underrated. You have him, you have Moten, you have Bozeman, you have Corbett who they got from the Rams. So they have a lot of, you know, talent on that offensive line that I feel like if it's available, it's just going to completely get plucked away. Uh, but I also don't think the Panthers are that far off. Um, you know, get a new head coach in there, get a new defensive coordinator. You're going to have a top pick this year. Like, I don't think they need to blow it up. So that's my concern with a trade like that is I don't know if the Panthers are going to make that, um, but I would love to see it. I'd love to see Corbett back. I think, man, Corbett was so huge for them last year, and he really has been uh, just since they you know got him. 
Kind of an underrated name here that no one's talking about is Lester Cotton from the Raiders. I just don't think there are these guys in the league that play really good offensive line and they're like sixth and seventh man. And like, they never get a chance to be a starter. And I feel like Lester Cotton is somebody that could call in and, you know, really help you out. Not only just in the run game, but I think in pass pro as well. Um, but I'm going to throw, you know, one more guy in here. I'm going to say Laramie Tunsil because here's the thing. Okay. This is a very unlikely scenario that the Texans who trade two first round picks for this guy would just get rid of him. But if the Rams are sitting there thinking we love Alaric Jackson, but maybe we like him more as a guard. Okay. And no boom concerns us because we just paid him all that money. And now he just suffered an Achilles tear. You know, you start to wonder. You, like, maybe they could make a move like that. And I'm not saying they will, but, I mean, I think he's the best name on the list. Uh, maybe him or Taylor Moten, uh, but I'm a big fan of his game, and I think Laramie Tunsil would be like having a bookend left tackle for the future, guaranteed. Obviously, we love what we see from Alaric Jackson, but it is a smaller sample size, so he's really going to get tested over the next few weeks going up against bigger competition and tougher competition, but... So far, what we've seen, we've seen good, but I have to mention Laramie Tunsil because I feel like he's the biggest name and I don't know if he's available, but NFL insiders out there have kind of, you know, floated the idea he might be. So, you know, we'll see. I personally, if I'm running the Texans, I'm not trading him, okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But they might. So I, I don't know. When you get those insiders talking like that, it's coming from NFL Network, I got to sit here and at least listen because, you know, they're, they got eyes and ears on the ground and everything. But that's what I'll say. Uh, lastly, wrapping it up, and then we'll we'll end it with uh, in a little OBJ banter uh, to to wrap it up. But uh, to wrap up the the trades here, Edge, who if there's anybody out there that can immediately come in that that's realistic, uh, can, immediately, uh, can immediately come in and make a day one impact and get that fifty six pressures way up. Uh, who is that from this um, from this list? Realistically, realistically, I know Cameron Jordan might not be a realistic or Bradley <laughs> Chubb might not be realistic. Someone who I think who would consider making the move, even though they're doing, you know, they've had a great season last year. Robert Quinn, who's playing for the Bears. He was with the Rams prior. I played with Robert Quinn. He's like Gumby. I mean, a man can bend. He can move. Um I think he would be a great addition. Uh, I'm not sure where he is in his career, right? Whether it comes to retiring or whatever that looks like. He's been playing for a while now, but he's familiar with, with the Los Angeles Rams, right? He's very familiar. Um, it's somebody that Aaron Donald's very familiar with. So then therefore Aaron Donald's play goes up a little bit. So that's someone that I would keep my eye out for. Um, Robert Quinn, man, he, what a guy I, I would love. Like ideally I would love to see it, right? If I had a, a magic, magical ball, uh, Robert Quinn would be the guy for me for sure. I love that. And I mean, I got to ask you, if you're Aaron Donald, aren't you like, hey, man, that Robert Quinn guy is, uh, you know, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he'd, he'd make old AD pretty darn happy. You know, uh, we need a guy like that. But at the same time, this team has shown you they want to go even like bigger, right? Like when they make these moves, they go they, that. And that's the thing, like Les Need said, you know, F them picks, we'll go and use them to get more players and, and win more Super Bowls. He said that after the whole, you know, Super Bowl uh, parade. So it's like, it makes you wonder, man. And I've been thinking about this because I think it really comes down to it. I, I've been thinking about it with OBJ, Cam, and it's like, is it that they really want OBJ, the person back, the player back? They love him. They want him. Or do they actually have a need for wide receiver? And then the same thing could be said about Edge. Did they really want Von Miller himself back, or are they actually like really concerned about that position? And the way that they're off, like the, the offseason went, they let Okoronkwo leave. They didn't add anybody in the offseason to replace Von. So it made you believe that really they just wanted Von, right? Like that they didn't really feel like that was a need because then the draft, they don't, uh, you know, really address the position until round seven with Daniel Hardy, who man, I wish he was healthy because I think he could actually add something, but unfortunately he's not. And we don't know if he's going to play this year. So it, it's frustrating that he's hurt. But at the same time, I'm sitting here like, what's the goal here? Because if the Rams really 
looked at this the whole time and like, we're going to ride with Justin Hollins. We're going to ride with Terrell Lewis. And if they don't pan out, then we got the draft capital. We got the ammo to go up and get a guy at the deadline. That's kind of where I think they're going. And I'll tell you right now, if Brian Burns is available and Jordan Rodriguez, who reports on this team for the athletics, she also reported for the Carolina Panthers at one point. She says she doesn't buy that Brian Burns is completely out of the question. She doesn't buy that he is unavailable. And, you know, the in the words of the the great, you know, million dollar man, Ted DiBiase Sr., everybody's got a price. I mean, you know, it's uh, <laughs> if the Rams offer a second this year to first in 2024, Carolina might actually take that. And, you know, I got to ask you your thoughts on this because like Brian Burns would be 100% my guy and I'm a diehard Robert Quinn fan. I have like three jerseys in my house with him. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, I yeah, love the guy. Love the guy. But Brian Burns is interesting because he's like 25 years old. So you you think about this. This is not just a move. Like I would offer more picks because I'm drafting Brian Burns with those picks essentially, just like I drafted Jalen Ramsey with those picks. And I saw how that worked out. And then you look at Brian Burns and you're like, man, I love AD, but AD will not be around after three, four years. I can, however, sign Brian Burns to be that guy. So maybe our window stays open and we have a, you know, a thing, a crutch to kind of hold on to. Burns is a stud. He's one of the best pass rushers in football. I don't know if I'm Carolina, if I'm trading him, but like I said, everybody's got a price. And so if that becomes, you know, available, do you think the Rams pull the trigger? Because I actually, Cam, I believe that's the deal that gets done if the Panthers are willing to move him. Yeah, because you got Christian McCaffrey. They want to run it back, but then they also want Burns on the defensive side too. So it's like, oh, which one do you go with? And you said something earlier uh, about the legacy of, of the defensive line at the Rams, right, with Aaron Donald. You almost didn't come back this year, but he decided to come back, you know, so... At this point, you got to keep the legacy going. It was funny because I was watching the uh, the Lakers and the Warriors. Jordan Poole got paid a whole bunch of money, right, to continue that Steph Curry legacy, the Splash Brothers legacy. And so, whatever legacy that Aaron leaves, he's gonna need someone to take that one, take that over, right? And so, you might be on to something. <laughs> you might you might be on to something with with Burns coming in. So we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Burns is more realistic than people give it credit for because the Rams. And you've you've heard commentators, you've watched the Rams games. Uh, I'm not hating on every commentator, but I've heard a lot of like the jokes like, oh, the Rams don't have a pick until 2036. Stop it. The Rams have a first round pick in 2024. We just don't know if they're going to keep it. <laughs> I mean, that's really <laughs> right. that's where we're at at this point. But no, I think that's possible. And I think Bradley Chubb uh, and Robert Quinn are probably the contingencies. I think the Rams want Burns. If I'm being honest, I think that's who they want. He fits their defense perfectly. That's who I think they want. Um, and, and I think Uche makes sense as kind of a cheaper option. Cleveland Farrell is kind of like a Dante Fowler a reclamation project, former first round bust, dare I say. I hate saying that, but you know, you go and you bring him in, and then all of a sudden he does well with you. And we saw what Dante Fowler did. It's a way to kind of revitalize your career. Cameron Jordan seems very unlikely, but I figured I would just, you know, kind of put him on the list because I've heard mention of, I don't see him leaving New Orleans. Uh, I feel like he's, you know, meant to retire there. Montez Sweat's an interesting one. If they decide to choose him over Dayron Payne or Dayron Payne over him, that's really going to be the deciding factor there. Um, and then Frank Clark from the Chiefs, Lorenzo Carter from the Falcons, who's playing very well. Jerry Hughes. I mean, I don't know why the Texans would hold on to this guy because he, he's older, but he, he's so good. And it's like, man, just let this guy go and win a Super Bowl. You know, you're not you're not competing this year. Um, you know, as, as sad as that is, because I think Lovey Smith does have this team competing, despite the fact I don't think they have a ton of talent. Uh, and then Marcus Davenport, who the Saints traded two first rounders to get. He hasn't quite panned out. Maybe this is an opportunity for him, but there are a lot of options, Cam, and uh, we're we're going to find out soon. But to wrap this thing up, because it has been a long but fun podcast, um, I'm going to throw this at you. 
I want to know, in your words, where do you think Odell Beckham Jr. is going to go? And if it's not the Rams, what do they do in response to something like that? So where does Odell go? If I if I had a crystal ball, if he were to go anywhere, right? Because it, it seems like he's getting towards the back end of his career. We don't know, right, with injuries and everything like that. So for Odell Beckham, he went from the Giants to the Browns to the Rams, won a Super Bowl. I, I could see him going maybe back to the Rams, hopefully, or the Giants, right? Because, like, you want to end up where you started a lot of times as, you know, as players. So you want to go back home. Uh, if he retires there, hopefully he gets inducted to the Hall of, Hall of Fame, whatever that looks like. But he probably wants to end that with the Giants. So we'll see. I know he mentioned he, he visited Sterling Shepard to go see how he would check up on his buddy. <laughs> Who knows what he's doing at this point. But if anything... Um, you know, home is where the heart is. And he won a Super Bowl with the Rams, so the heart could be here, right? Also, the Giants as well. I, I could see, you know, one of those two things. And if Odell doesn't come, that's okay because at the bye week, they're going to start with the foundation, that offensive line, that defensive line. They're running back as well when it comes. We have Henderson. Henderson's crushing it. But I think just firming up that offensive line, firming up that defensive line, making sure Henderson's good to go. He has backup. He has what he needs. Support him if you can. But if if Odell doesn't come, I, I would think to the Rams, I think he would go to the Giants. That's uh, that's interesting because I think I, if he doesn't go to the Rams, I just feel like he's going to the Bills. I don't want to see it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tired of Vaughn saying it, but I feel like that's where he would go. Um, but it's interesting because he's got a, in a tremendous amount of respect for Tom Brady and, you know, it's his last year. So maybe he would consider going there. I don't know if, if I mean, I'll say this right now. If the Rams can swing Christian McCaffrey and Odell, like you kind of alluded to the idea of potentially doing uh, when we were talking about McCaffrey, I don't see how Odell doesn't go back to the Rams because that would just open up more opportunities for him. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, as a player, you know, you're trying to set yourself up, at least in some facet. Obviously, you want to win. You, you want to help your team win. But, I mean, Odell's got to look. Like, last year, that was his opportunity to cash in. He gets hurt and gets the unfortunate short end of the stick. Uh, would he have gotten the Allen Robinson $15 million a year deal? I absolutely believe that's him this year uh, if he didn't get hurt. So, yeah, I would say yes. But now he has to work on trying to get that contract back and kind of secure it because he hasn't had those deals in a little bit now. And so I feel like, you know, he's really trying to cash in and it's, he wants to win a Super Bowl, but he also kind of needs to balance it out. Like he needs to still have production wherever he goes. So it, it sounds weird because you're adding another threat in Christian McCaffrey to some people would say, take away from him, but in the way like the greatest show on turf worked with Marshall Falk and, you know, Tory Holt, Isaac Bruce, all those guys complement each other. So maybe the stats weren't perfect. Like maybe that's what holds back Tory Holt with the Hall of Fame. Anyway, it's ridiculous. But maybe that's what's holding him back. He doesn't have like the gaudy numbers that like maybe, you know, a T.O. had when, you know, Arnez Battle was the other wide receiver alongside him, not quite an Isaac Bruce. But at the same time, it opens up things for him. And so then you have Christian McCaffrey of Cooper Cub, Allen Robinson, Van Jefferson. Odell is already well respected among this organization. He's going to get his bread and he's going to get his opportunities. And even more, now it's like, how do you defend Odell? How do you defend Cup? How do you defend Christian McCaffrey? You can't just like, yeah, you know, we're not going to cover Van. Good luck. We're not going to cover Allen. Good luck. We're not going to cover Cup. You're insane. You know, it just, that's what it gets to. And so I feel like if they're able to swing a deal for Christian McCaffrey, um, and I don't even feel like they need it, to be honest with you, to win this Super Bowl cam. Uh, but if they were to do that, I mean, this would be one of the craziest offenses on paper I've ever seen. And Christian McCaffrey has missed 23 games and he's been on the injury report 29 weeks in his career total. That's a lot. But if he were to stay healthy and you got Odell, I don't care if this team doesn't have a pass rush because I don't know who's going to outscore this team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So uh, I mean, you know, we'll see. But I'll, I'll say this: if if they were to get McCaffrey at the bye and get him acclimated for that 49er game, I don't know if the 49ers have a chance in hell of winning that game. The Rams coming off the bye, they're healthier, and then they'd have McCaffrey. I I just really I, I think they're going to try to get something done. I think McCaffrey 100% gets traded. I just don't know if it's going to be the Rams. I got about a 50% chance, uh, you know, of belief in that. But 
that is what I have to say. Do you have any final thoughts, Cam, before I let you go? I really man. appreciate your time. Yeah, man, it's been great. Um, you know, it, it's the bye week, so all the Rams fans, practice grace. <laughs> practice grace this week. Just know the offensive line, they're working on it. Uh, they're getting things together, um, and so is the Rams organization. It, it's It's early. It's early. We got a lot of football left. So, you know, stay stay in there. And, uh, yeah, Jake, thanks for having me on, my man. Absolutely, Cam. It's been a pleasure. You're the man. And uh, really appreciate your time. That's going to do it. I'm Jake Ellenbogen. He is Cameron Lynch. And this has been Believe in Rams podcast, episode number 129, helping you get through the bye. Uh, and I'll be back next week to cover the next game, which is the Niners week. You guys take care, and I'll see you guys soon.